Unsurprisingly, Red Dead Redemption is a game full of people showing valor, honor, and unquestionable bravery. It is also a game full of pathetic cowards, smooth-talking liars, and acts of kindness gone unrewarded. Some deserve death, while others deserve pity. Some even deserve both. Hi, this is Dash for Curse, and today we're looking at the most pathetic characters that Red Dead Redemption has to offer. Gotta get out there and scare them off. You wanna come with me? Safer with two. Okay. Or was it Four Card Monty? I forget. Hey. He was a real nice chap. Or maybe he was a real bastard. <laughs> he was real drunk last time, John. Irish. Irish doesn't even have a real name. He's only ever known as Irish. And like any good Irish stereotype, he's constantly drunk, telling tall tales, and generally causing trouble. While Irish is generally helpful in missions, getting you a Gatling gun and some other heavy armaments, he's basically worthless during those missions. His usual pattern is to tell Marston to do something, then to trot off and hide somewhere, probably cowering, skulking, sulking, and drinking. Irish's friend Shaky might even be a more pathetic character than he. The first time you see him, he's tied up and beaten by bandits who have inevitably betrayed him, and Shaky has a very pronounced stutter. Thank you for your kindness, mister. And Irish treats him like utter crap. You still owe me for them morphine pills to calm your nerves. <laughs> but unlike Irish, he's an honorable man who keeps his word and actually fights alongside Marston, showing his bite is worse than his bark, which is basically the opposite of Irish. Of course, Irish might have the most pathetic death of anyone. A news clipping implies he accidentally shot himself to death in a thieves' landing outhouse. Is it deserved? You tell me. Hey, come on now! Look at it this way. I know we ain't exactly old pals, but you know, have I ever done you wrong? I need the man, partner. I need him. Seth Bryce. Seth Bryce is a, a, a treasure hunter, sort of. At least he started out as a treasure hunter. The act of finding treasure is now such an obsession for him, he has basically descended to grave robbing, which I guess is treasure if you think about it. I reckon I'll sit here a while trying to figure this out. I'm gonna be rich. By the time you meet him, Bryce is already showing a questionable level of sanity, getting all kissy with corpses. His pursuit of treasure led him to near madness. He lost his family, his business, and anything else he had to his name, and now lives a completely vagrant lifestyle. Now that lifestyle involves him digging up dead bodies for loot, and often treating said bodies like friends, or perhaps more than friends. While the antics you see from Bryce are certainly amusing, there's just something profoundly sad about a smelly, grave-robbing loner whose only friends are corpses, as if the land of the living has rejected him entirely. Well, they don't care, do you, boys? Honest folk, off to a better place. Apart from that Aiden O'Leary fella, I never liked him. Ah, uh, give it up, old man. That's Mr. West Dickens to you, boy. Nigel West Dickens. Nigel West Dickens is a literal snake oil salesman. He's a traveling salesman who sells a special elixir that he claims to be a cure-all for any ailment. Well, I represent the only company that makes the genuine article that cures headaches, neuralgia, uh, earache, toothaches, backache, swelling, sprains, sore chests, swelling of the throats, contracted cords and muscles, anxieties and ravaged nerves, stiff joints, wrenches, dislocations, cuts and bruises, and it adds vitality and vigor to the healthy man. <laughs> now, of course, Dickens also makes reference to his repeat customers, suggesting that Dickens might just be selling some kind of drug. You know, cocaine was kind of prolific back in those times as a cure-all. Of course, he just says that it regrows lost limbs and brings people back from their deathbeds, you know, <laughs> so everyday medical stuff that can be proven. Of course, his fast-talking sales shtick doesn't protect him from bullets, as one of your first interactions with him will have him shot and bleeding out near his stagecoach. As he over-dramatizes his condition, Marston is tasked with driving him back to town and fighting off bandits who, of course, want to finish him off, at least shut that mouth up. Dickens is a frequent traveler, presumably to avoid anger and bad word of mouth from the effects of his elixir. 
elixir. Now, at one point, he looks to go overseas to begin peddling his miracle cure, but ends up in jail for selling narcotics. Hello, Wes Dickens. <laughs> Thought you were headed to Peking. Um, so did I. So did I. A long story. But now it seems I'm being put under arrest and charged with narcotic possession or some other such nonsense. When I'm gone, they'll just find another monster. Dutch Vanderlyn. Dutch is Marston's main target for most of the game. He's the leader of the self-titled Dutch's Gang, which Marston is tasked with eliminating in exchange for his and his family's freedom. There's no doubt that Dutch led a life as a vicious outlaw. You would assume there isn't too much to pity about him, but this is Red Dead Redemption, a game that makes you see things from a new light. Once Marston finally corners him, you don't see a brutal, ruthless killer. You see a broken man whose career as an outlaw began with an idealistic, Robin Hood-like mentality. He thought his actions were those of a savior of the people. My whole life, all I ever did was fight. His gang eventually just descended into mindless pillaging. Dutch, in his final moments, knows that his actions were never justified and that he caused much more harm than good in his lifetime. As a result, instead of having a climactic gunfight with Marston, he simply ends his life himself. Our time has passed. Yeah. I improvised an escape plan. I'm more of a planner than a man of action. <laughs> Harold McDougall. Harold McDougall is perfectly indicative of an academic elite at the turn of the 20th century. He's on sabbatical from Yale and so has decided to bring his scientific mind out into the field. Unfortunately, his brand of science is that of old-timey science that talks about how the savage is subhuman and incapable of engaging in civilization. What makes some societies great like ours and others, uh, yeah, not worse. I would never use a bunch of such as worse, but, 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 but lesser. Meaning? Meaning. What makes these beings less human than us? Closer to beast on the continuum between animal and god, you know. In other words, McDougall's idea of science is blind racism, lightly masked with scientific terms. He runs with his own preconceptions and demonstrates complete ignorance to Native American culture, and he even takes blood samples and proves to himself that the blood of the natives is the same as his own. It's a remarkable breakthrough. I've been looking at the blood of both natives and white men of corresponding height, weight, and age, and you know what? Again, no. They're exactly the same. It's remarkable. It completely refutes my last book. But then he rejects the results and clings to his bias. Now, it is also worth noting that McDougall is badly addicted to cocaine. Would you uh, like to partake of a syringe of cocaine? And it's pretty strongly implied that his sabbatical from Yale is less of a sabbatical and more of he got kicked out for using cocaine and he's a bit of a mess. Where's my tincture? <gasps> My heart is pure, and we meet as equals. These savages must be spoken to simply in metaphors. No, sir. I grew up on a reservation and attended school. Nastus. Nastus might be the most sympathetic character Marston ever interacts with. And the thing is, there's nothing about Nastus that is pathetic. What's pathetic is the way other people treat him just because he is Native American. Nastus is an agent assigned by Edgar Ross to help Marston with his work against Dutch's gang. And in stark contrast to basically everyone else Marston meets, he's good-hearted, generally pacifistic, and loyal. It doesn't seem like backstabbing Marston is ever even a thought in his mind. In fact, he's not even out for himself at all. His only goal is to find and reform his fellow tribesmen who have joined up with Dutch's gang. At every turn though, Nastus is treated like absolute garbage. McDougall dismisses him as a savage, despite Nastus receiving a classical English education. The savage heart cannot be conventionally civilized. I was right all along. <laughs> if anything, Nastus is intellectually superior to McDougall, which is painfully obvious. Ross is equally dismissive of him. Why don't you see if you can help him in his study of the native problem in this county? That's a good one. As is noted racist shopkeeper Herbert Moon. Well, I don't like Jews or colored folk. 
or natives, now that you mention it. Narcissus never retaliates, and he even stands up for McDougal, calling him a good man, as McDougal continues to throw racial slurs at him. Narcissus is intelligent, competent, and honorable, but never gets the respect he, or I guess, in a broader sense, his people ever deserve. This is not what we agreed to. You shut your mouth, you treacherous snake! Oh, shit! Damn, don't touch! Professor, get down, now! I need to find two men so I can return to America. Mm, no problem. I will help you find those men. And you return, you will win a people her freedom. Viva Mexico! Luisa Fortuna. Luisa Fortuna is a school teacher and revolutionary who has also lost her entire family at the age of 19. I have lost my father. My mother is in the United States. My sister has fled. I have no family. Just because. When Marston first meets her, she's in prison. Upon busting her out of a government jail, Marston learns that she's fallen hopelessly in love with Abraham Reyes, the leader of the local rebellion. Being young and naive, she devotes herself fully to Reyes and faithfully believes in his cause. She believes they're soon to be married as well, which is, would be fine, but Reyes himself can't even remember Fortuna's first name, calling her Lara instead of Luisa. Tu sabes que en esta luz puedo ver el fuego en tus ojos. Laura, dame la fuerza para luchar. He has absolutely no interest in marrying Fortuna or anyone else for that matter. He believes it is his duty to spread his genes to as many different women as possible, and he feels absolutely nothing special towards Fortuna. When Reyes is captured and about to be executed, Fortuna charges his captors with a knife, prompting them to shoot and kill her. Her distraction buys precious time for Marston to gun down Reyes' captors and free him. Even then, after she sacrificed her life for Reyes, he fails to even recall her name. Who was she? Your peasant girl wife-to-be? Oh yes, of course, she, she will have a day named after her. Laura's day! Luisa. What? Oh yes, I, I know Laura as well. My name is Jack Marston. Jack Marston. Ultimately, Jack Marston carries out the final revenge against Edgar Ross on behalf of his father and the rest of his family, and he assumes John's place as a hero of the West. But ultimately, that's not the life he wanted for himself. That's not even the life John wanted for him. For much of the game, Jack is a kind, somewhat awkward teenager. He dreams of being a writer and has an idealistic view of the world. Part of John's entire character arc is preserving that outlook in his son by shielding him from the harsher realities of his life. But three years after John is gunned down by an army of federal agents, Jack loses his family and becomes an aimless outlaw, everything his father didn't want him to be. With Ross considered a hero and John remembered by history as a ruthless outlaw, Jack's revenge isn't even satisfying. If anything, it's sort of sad. You killed my father. Your father killed himself with the life he lived. You killed him. I saw you. Killing Ross gains him nothing and begins his life as a vagrant outlaw, the exact life his father tried to shield him from all those years. That's it for now, but there are plenty more pathetic cowards and slimy swindlers in Red Dead Redemption. Let us know in the comments below if we've missed any that you love because the game is full of them. This is Dash for Kurt saying thanks for watching and enjoy the game. <laughs> Come on, brother. I think we should go our separate ways, huh?